My 5700 XT and non-XT reviews are a bit late to the party, so I figured I'd give you everything in one lump sum. And one advantage I do have in this regard is the ability to test Radon's latest offerings in terms of drivers, and the most recent driver, the one that I used for all of these tests, was released on July 16th, so it's rather modern. I plan to test six different cards, they're all in front of me, you can't see them, but uh, there's a lot of them here. And prices range from the low to mid 200s up to the high 400s, depending on where you look. So, hold on to your pants. The Be Quiet Dark Rock Slim may be small, but it also packs one heck of a punch. It won't interfere with your system RAM because it's super slim. It's also super easy to install, and it looks mighty fine in virtually any brick. Oh, and did I mention the cooler runs quiet? I know, nothing in the product's name would have suggested it. Okay, I'll be quiet now. Grab the Dark Rock Slim via the link in this video's description. By this point, I'm sure you're already familiar with how both the 5700 and XT reference cards look. Love it or hate it, the XT variant sports the signature dent next to the red illuminated Radeon logo. It also has a backplate, whereas the 5700, the cheaper of the two, does not. Both support an 8 plus 6 pin supplemental power config and both run fairly hot to say the least. I'm gonna get thermals out of the way first because I think it'd be unfair to compare reference cards, which traditionally run hot, to AIBs with custom air coolers. Out of the box, Navi in its reference form is hot, very hot. This graph represents idle and low GPU temps for each card. The load scenario entailed a 30 minute 3 Mark Fire Strike Ultra loop. Load temps are max temps in this case. Clearly our AMD cards are struggling a bit, particularly the newest reference models. The other cards on this chart come nowhere close to this temperature under load, even our reference RTX 2060. This is technically a, a reference card, albeit it's also, Nvidia calls it the Founders Edition cards, but these are designed much differently and as a result they run much quieter and cooler under load. I do expect AIBs will perform significantly better in this regard, and it's one of the reasons why I suggest you wait a while before buying one of the 5700s. By the way, I'd take these idle temps here with a grain of salt. Some of these cards shut off their fans below a certain temperature, so they're inclined to stay a bit hotter for longer under idle conditions. And as you can expect, the hotter cards tend to run a bit louder with the Radeon 5700 and XT models topping the charts at around 44 decibels a piece. Our Vega 56 card, that's this beefy card right here, AIB from Power Color, actually ran pretty quiet under load but was plagued with coil wine which brought it up to around 40 decibels. This would have been around 38 decibels had the coil wine not been present, it's that loud. I actually just ran the card with fans to about the same RPM as what they were under load and of course the card's technically not under load when you're just you know spooling up the fan so uh, that came in at around 38 decibels so yeah bit of coil line there and it's detectable in this Vega 56 variant but the other cards really didn't have much of that. Speaking of which I haven't properly introduced the other cards tested here first we have the Gigabyte RTX 2070 Super. It's the most expensive card on our list, but also the most powerful. And if you're into realistic reflections and flashy lighting, baked in RT and tensor cores are a nice bonus. It all depends on who you are and what you play. Now, in addition to the 2070 Super, we have the 2070 from Gigabyte, and this one's in white, so it's easy for me at least to distinguish between the two. It has a noticeably smaller cooler. You can see it's not as beefy as the 2070 Super, but it still delivers excellent thermal performance and cooling metrics. Up next is the RTX 2060. This is the FE model, and I've covered it in a dedicated video up here. My thoughts really haven't changed much since then. Last, we have the Vega 56. I just showed you from Power Color in the mix because why not, right? Vega cards have come down considerably in price as of late, and I'm curious how it stacks up to some of the bigger boys on this list. It just might be able to punch above its weight class. So with that out of the way, the last thing to quickly address is our test bench 8600K, 16 gigs of DDR4, a Z370 motherboard from MSI, and a Be Quiet Dark Rock Slim. Our operating system is loaded onto a SATA M.2, and all games were loaded from a two terabyte hard drive. And for those wondering, our Core i5 wasn't a bottleneck in any of these scenarios. I bumped up anti-aliasing and other things that are gonna put a heavy load on the graphics card. Uh, in fact, the only scenario in which the CPU was even being somewhat heavily utilized was in 3D Mark, where our 
our, our overall scores would include the CP results as well. Graphic scores, though, are differentiated, and I included those in our graphs. So I started with 3D Mark Fire Strike, and this will give us a general assessment of graphical horsepower in the DX11 API. And to my surprise, the 5700XT did an excellent job keeping up with the higher price 2070 Super. There was a bit of variance in our CPU scores, but overall, things were virtually neck and neck. And to be honest, the 5700 wasn't far behind. That's the non-XT variant. Moving on to Fire Strike Extreme, which bumps the res up to 1440p, the gap is nearly identical. I'm seriously shocked here. You'd think for the price, the 5700XT would be falling behind as it becomes the bottleneck, but nope. Let's hope this continues into our other games, though. But quickly, our last Fire Strike test, Fire Strike Ultra in 4K, and yeah, the two are trading blows yet again. Good news for the red team so far, at least. Moving on to Grand Theft Auto V, you'll find a very similar trend. The 2070 Super, of course, comes out on top, followed by its non-Super counterpart, followed by the 5700 XT. Interesting note here, the two latest Radon cards struggled hard down low, with the lowest 1% and 0.1% of frames especially coming in at under 40 FPS, suggesting infrequent and sharp stuttering. Our Vega 56 card came in last, but it's also the cheapest card on this list by far, and held its own even among the lowest 1% and 0.1% of frames. Up next, F1 2017 literally flips the script with respect to our lower frame averages. I was kind of shocked by this. Our RTX cards struggled a great deal here, literally all of them, and I'm not sure why exact same settings in 1440p. I, I really can't even say I've seen this in some of my older tests, so I'm not sure if this is like the specific driver that's causing these issues or if it's a game update. I have no idea. What I can say, however, is that average frame rates fall in line roughly where we'd expect them to further down the list. The 5700 and 2060 nearly tie on average, and the XT actually outperforms the Super across the board. By the way, all of these benches were conducted at least twice for consistency's sake. If I thought numbers were a bit too far apart between runs, I ran a third test to narrow down the variance just in case you're wondering or are doubting these numbers. I wanted to test a few games with newer APIs as well, and that's where games like Ashes of the Singularity and Shadow of the Tomb Raider come in. Here, I honestly expected the RX 5700 XT to win, and it did come awfully close. In fact, medium and heavy loads were nearly indistinguishable. As for the 5700, well, yeah, it absolutely creamed the RTX 2060 and nearly tied our Vega 56, which, mind you, is 100 USD cheaper on eBay. In DX12, again, Shadow of the Tomb Raider gave us a win for the 5700 over the RTX 2060, but a loss for the XT model over the 2070 Super. This is an NVIDIA optimized title after all, but it'd be nice to see things scale rather linearly here with respect to price, and that is what we're seeing for the most part. Even 95% averages scale this way in 1440p with the highest preset and a bit of anti-aliasing. Another non-DX11 title that I was sure to test was Doom. In the Vulcan API, everything performed incredibly well across the board. AMD cards struggled a bit more down low to my surprise, but the experience all around was definitely playable in the Ultra preset. And perhaps this says a bit more about the API and less about the cards themselves, since virtually every one of them was hitting the 200 FPS cap at some point. I should also point out that this benchmark is entirely dependent on my ability to retrace steps. The idea is to be as repetitive as possible, to introduce this little variance as possible, possible, and it isn't always perfect. Lastly, I tested Witcher 3. It's a pretty graphically intensive game, and again, our RX 5700s fell a bit short among the lowest 0.1% of frames. In fact, it was definitely noticeable while benchmarking. There were several stutters here and there. And that said, in terms of overall averages, we don't see anything really out of place. The 5700 ties the 2060, and the XT keeps up with the 2070. NVIDIA cards do tend to perform a bit better here, which is why I'm always sure to turn off things like Hairworks in the Ultra preset. Uh, what I ultimately think this comes down to, though, is driver optimization. We're still in the early stages for these R RX cards uh, for the 5700 and XT. And if you look at our Vega 56, actually, that's a card that's been allowed to mature uh, for quite a while now, managed quite well, even down low. So we'll revisit games like these at a later date once the drivers have matured. So from the games tested here, my conclusion is this. NVIDIA cards, by and large, are still running a bit more expensive. What you're getting, though, for that trade-off is a lower TDP, which translates to more effective cooling. You get quieter cards in general as a consequence of that. You get driver sets that, at least in my experience, aren't always as buggy. 
out of the gate. And uh, yeah, with that said, I do think the RX 5700 and XT variants are great values despite what they give up. And we're just talking about reference cards here. I do expect AIBs to do better jobs in the cooling department, pretty typical and not an outlandish expectation. I also expect drivers to improve with time. Certain games will fare better than others. We saw the XT occasionally trading blows with higher price 2070s, but the fact remains that Nvidia cards at this point are more refined. Is that AMD's fault? Kind of, but kind of not. And I say all of that to say this, if I was buying a solid 1440p graphics card today, I'd honestly pick none of these cards. I still think the 2070s are too expensive in their AIB forms to justify the often marginal performance gains over early 5700 XT samples and even RTX 2060s. And in my opinion, RTX 2060s are almost kind of redundant. I think that the 1660 Ti comes awfully close in many games and lacks RT and Tensor cores to keep the price nice and low. It can handle 1440p, albeit with a few in-game compromises, and stays nice and cool thanks to a low power draw and thermal output. As it stands, the RX 5700 and XT are great values, but they come with hefty compromises in their current forms, which I expect AIBs to change. It's only a matter of time, and then we can compare true value for money cards. Speaking of which, a bit off topic here, I'm gonna to shift to this card. I think that our Vega 56 from Power Color surprised me. It actually would trade blows with the 1660 Ti, which, I mean, that's pretty good at this price point. It is gonna consume more power, but this one's got a beefy cooler to keep temps in check and sound in check. Worth considering if you're in the market for a used car that packs a punch. That's all for this one though. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe, click that bell, and consider becoming a member if you're feeling fancy. This is Science Studio. Thanks for benchmarking with us.